Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. Leaving behind a godly legacy is an important challenge you've heard us address many times here on Family Talk. As believers, we are called to instill in future generations God-honoring principles and virtues. And one man who heavily invested biblical values into his family is the late Reverend Billy Graham. Today, we're going to hear from one of his grandchildren, Sissy Graham Lynch, who is living proof of Dr. Graham's mindfulness and faithfulness to God. Sissy is the eldest daughter of Franklin Graham. Franklin Graham, of course, is the head of Samaritan's Purse and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Sissy works closely with both ministries as a spokesperson and special projects producer. And in just a moment, she'll talk with Dr. Tim Clinton about her struggles of growing up as a Graham. Sissy will also share how her faith and work have been influenced by her grandfather's life. There's a lot of applicable content to get to, so let's begin. Here now is our host for today's broadcast, Dr. Tim Clinton. Sissy, thank you for joining us here on Family Talk. It's a delight to have you. Oh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. You know, it's pretty wild. We were uh, today at the March for Life event, and we're recording, but uh, it was amazing to me to be over there in that crowd. It was my first time. I didn't really know what to expect. I was overwhelmed by the numbers, but especially the young people there today. It was the young people that's, that shocked me. I mean, there were high schoolers, college kids, young um, adults everywhere. Yeah, it everywhere. Was the young people, which I realize like the future is bright. This is a generation that's raising up a voice of truth and love. They're doing it in a loving and graceful way. It was so peaceful out there today and so loving. But this is a generation that's standing up and saying, no more, not on our watch. You know, a lot of people um, uh, think that that generation is running away from God, that they could care less about values, family, and more. But, Sissy, there seems to be kind of an uprising. There's a stirring in that generation. Mm-hmm. I know that's kind of your generation. Um, do you really believe that? I do, especially today on this subject about life. When you see the far left going so vile and so evil on the subject of abortion, it's become 92% of abortions are elective now, and it's become so vulgar when in 2016 Hillary Clinton on a presidential debate, I sat on my couch, I'll never forget her talking about a late late term abortion. And my heart, I said, how could we be a nation where a president candidate is just up there, just casually talking? It was so evil. And I think this generation, science is no longer on the left side. We have science on our side. We have God, we have the truth. And this generation, I was so amazed today at the young people standing up, marching families and a voice all the way up to the Supreme Court for their voices to be heard. It was incredible. I'll never forget it. And I got my dad to come today. Yes. Let's talk about your dad for a moment. Sissy Graham Lynch. Your dad is Franklin. And uh, hey, how did he wind up coming here today? Well, he was supposed to be in Africa this week. It got canceled. So I just called him up. I had been planning to come up. I'd wanted to see this for so long. You know, we encourage people to take a stand and we encourage people to have a voice and make a difference. I had never seen it. So I really felt guilty. I said, I need to go see this for myself. And I called him up. I said, Dad, your trip was canceled. I said, why don't you come up and march with me? Just us. We'll walk the streets. And he did it. And you were right in the crowd. Yeah, we did nothing special. It was very organic, just the two of us and some of his staff. And it was so fun. I mean, he was encouraged. I think he just couldn't believe it. I was stunned. Yeah, I mean, really stunned. I mean, we were lost in a sea of people, but the energy was just amazing to me. Uh, Let's talk about the Graham family. You know, I'd I'd like to uh, just endear audience to you personally. Um, I love the voice God's given to you, and we're going to talk about that. But what was it like growing up Graham? I get that question all the time. I know you do. But I think, you know, growing up, you just didn't know anything different. Yeah. Um, It was very just normal in our homes. And I can't remember the first time I went to like one of my grandfather's crusades and saw, you know, the vastness of it and think anything different. Because at home, we called him Daddy Bill and he was just Daddy Bill. And at home, dad was just dad. Um, It wasn't probably until I was older that I really struggled being with a gram. I was a teenager. I hated being a gram. I resented my dad being gone a lot and traveling a lot. And I had a really difficult time. I ran from it for a long time. But then it was when I was 19 years old, I went on a trip around the world with my dad. And I had traveled with my dad before, but it was then that God changed my heart. 
and I saw different projects Samaritan's Purse was working on, and I realized God took my dad, because my dad was obedient to God's calling on his life. And I realized, yeah, there have been some negative things. I have a dad that's been gone and certain, but how thankful I am for a dad who's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and took it all around the world. And that's at 1819, my heart started changing. If you follow you and your dad, you know there's a real fondness uh, of your dad toward you. Mm. I mean, I know he loves all of his kids, but there are a lot of pictures with you. You guys spend some moments together. Um, I've seen you in, in the cockpit with your dad on a plane flying through the middle of nowhere. Um, yeah. But there's a boldness that has begun to sort of uh, kind of define your life. I mean, you're not afraid to step into moments. You're not afraid to step into issues now. What's, what's feeding some of that? You're a young mom. We're going to talk about all this converging together. But where's that coming from inside of you? That's never been hard for me. But that's because... I had a father who set that example before me. I saw a dad that was bold with the gospel, unashamed to stand on biblical truth, no matter what it meant. So for me, I grew up with that. It's maybe in our blood and our bones. Um, it's never been difficult. You know, I was just sharing with you, I was at Liberty University for two years. When I transferred to go to a very liberal school, Appalachian State, the first thing the lady said to me was Miss Liberty. <laughs> she hated Jerry Falwell Sr. at the time. Yeah. And I had to learn then uh, in college, how am I going to stand on my own and how am I going to know what I believe and why I believe it? Because my dad wasn't going to be there to defend me. I had to know God's word and be able to stand strong and to be able to have a voice and not back down. Yeah. Sissy. The name Sissy. <laughs> is it your name? It's, uh, well, that is my name. <laughs> yes, it might not Sissy. be my legal name. Mm -hmm. I was named after my mom and my grandmother, Jane, but nobody knows that. Day one from the hospital, it's always been Sissy. So your brothers have always called you Sissy? And... Yes, sir. Everybody. It, it, maybe even as I get older, you know, I've had like my aunt always went by Bunny and she changed it. She got older to Ruth. But I couldn't ever change my name back to Jane. I love Sissy's who I am. You know, yeah. your dad has a place up in uh, Alaska. Uh, oh, I went fishing uh, up on the Iliamna River oh, wow. two summers ago, mm -hmm. and we flew kind of over mm -hmm. uh, that place. Did you spend a lot of time up there? We grew up there. Since I was probably in the third grade, we've spent every summer up there. When I was in the fifth grade, my parents finally bought a cabin in Alaska. And for my dad, my dad's a pilot. He doesn't play golf or do anything else, but he loves to fly. He learned when he was 18 years old. And I say when my dad flies, that's like his golf course. So when we went to Alaska, dad could get away from work. We could get away. And it's like he lived on a golf course living in the mountains. And But he always took ministry there. We had different ministries throughout villages, building churches. And now we have a program called Operation Heal Our Patriots in Alaska for yeah. wounded veterans and their spouses. And you take them up there. They get marriage counseling, spiritual counseling. Um, for five days, they get to come up there. All, you know, all expenses paid. These military marriages... Very few of them focus on the marriage of the wounded veteran. And these, um, instead of husband and wife, they're caretaker and patient. Wow. So we really focus on the spiritual aspect and the marriage. Let's go back to football for a moment. Okay. Happy State. Uh, you like football. You met somebody there. His name's Corey. Uh, tell us a little bit about him. Um, fascinating piece. Happy State. Uh, there's that game and that's basically recorded in college history where they showed up and beat Michigan. Uh, it was the opening game, opening game of the season. Yeah, wasn't 2007. It? It's a long time ago. I don't know if people remember that anymore in town. But, but this gentleman named Corey, Corey. was involved in all the money. Yeah. So my husband, I was at Liberty University, and he was at App State when we first met. So I ended up transferring, fell in love, ate a lot of words. Now we know why you went to App State. I know, okay, but you know it. what? The mm -hmm. cool thing is. Corey just got his pilot. He just got his pilot's license, and he did it through Liberty University. So it's so cool. So now all my brothers went to Liberty at some point. Two of them graduated. One went and then went to West Point. All my sister in laws graduated from Liberty. I've gone. Now my husband Corey even has some Liberty <laughs> classes under really? his belt. Wow. So, anyways, but he played football at App State. Went on to play in the NFL six years, and we now live in Florida with two children. But um, our career in the NFL was so. It was a sweet time for us. It was a precious time. It's not what you see on TV, and I loved it. We had great Bible studies. Um, he had a back injury that ended his career. Wow. And when you don't end things on your own terms, yeah, it's tough. it can be very difficult. Yeah, because you're lost. You figure that's, this is what you're going to do all, the rest of your life, or it's all you know. Or we knew it wouldn't be the rest being football, but we thought, you know, 10 yeah. years will end on our own terms, and mm -hmm. it's painful when you have to deal with things. So you, um, you work at Samaritan's Purse. 
and the um, Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And BGEA, right? Good job. You got it. That's a mouthful acronym. Well, it is. Um, so, see, what do you do? What do you do there? So, I'm a spokesperson for both ministries. Um, at BGA, I have a podcast called Fearless, mm-hmm. and then at Samaritan's Purse, I special projects producer for different projects at different times of the year, and go. Right now, depending on my heart, I'm a young mom, and so the, our maternal child health programs are really important to me, helping other women around the world. Um, but then at BGA, is what we're kind of talking about is having a fearless faith in a compromising culture is really my passion right now. You're listening to Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Dr. Tim Clinton, uh, president of the American Association of Christian Counselors and executive director of the James Dobson Family Institute. Our special in-studio guest today, Sissy Graham Lynch. And uh, God has raised her up. She's becoming a strong voice uh, for such a time as this. Sissy, one of the uh, real issues of our day is um, giving a voice back to the voiceless. We're here at March for Life. Women in a lot of ways have struggled to have a voice and to have a, a real influence in the church and more. What are you seeing are some of the biggest issues that women are, maybe young women in particular, wrestling with, things that concern you that you think we have got to deal with? Mm-hmm. I think if I was to look at it with a lot of issues that we're dealing with, one of the roots of it is, as a generation and as a church, as Christians, if we proclaim to be Christians, we don't know God's word, and that's a dangerous place to be in. We don't know what we believe and why we believe it. So how can we take a stand in a society on these issues like abortion and life and um, our Supreme Court justices and all of these things if we don't know what God's word has to say? We right. wouldn't be able to stand in confidence. Right. So that's, I think, the number one thing is we don't know God's word. Um, But for young women, I know for me and some of my friends, I think a thing that is sweeping our country is anxiety and depression and fear. And we saw in 2019, one of the um, number one Bible verses Googled was be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and petition. That's because we have a generation that the joy is being, Satan is robbing us of the joy of thy salvation in, in planting this fear and anxiety. And it's sweeping over in our our churches, our pastors, our pastors' wives. Um, And I'm just really coming to terms with that. And for the first time in my life, I struggled with that this past year. And I I didn't understand it. So that, I think, is a huge thing in our church right now. I think the pace that we run, the pressures that come in. I was reading a piece recently talking about vertical. We actually, in life, you have the ebb and flow and their normal stressors that we deal with. But these vertical things that drop in out of nowhere that blow up our world and make it complicated, Mm. make it really tough on us. And so trying to deal with that, and you're right, it's easy to get overwhelmed, to get lost, to get disconnected vertically with God, disconnect with those you love the most, to worry about your kids. Um, Am I attached? Am I dialed in like I need to be and more? Sissy, I mean, what do you say through your podcast, Fearless? What do you say to young women? Um, My daughter Megan would say, Dad, ask her. You know, mm-hmm. how does she handle uh, dealing with everything? She works know. as a dermatologist. <laughs> she has a little girl. She has a husband she got to take care of. She wants to be a testimony. She works in a non Christian environment and more. Yeah. I mean, it's like, what do you do, Dad? Oh, man, that's so hard because everybody's story is so different. And I think for me, for my one thing I've been telling some of my friends, young working moms, it's okay in this world to say no. That if you put too many things on your plate, eventually one thing's going to fall off your plate. And I just talked about that with another friend. But these women, say no. Open up your calendar for your family. Put your kids first, especially if you're a working mom, that it's okay to say no. And I've had to say no. And that's hard. I mean, I've been on the road with you guys quite a bit doing uh, things all over the country. And I work for two ministries in a different state than I live in. And I have to say goodbye to my kids a lot. But I say no to probably 90% of stuff that come on my desk because wow. I have to. I have to be able to juggle and do it and balance it. Yeah. So as, as young moms, we don't have to do it all, and you need to say no to a lot. Sissy, what do you think of the whole social media insanity? <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. I'm honestly. a millennial. And by the way, your dad, who is unafraid, he's fearless. Like, I mean, seriously, he just goes, you know, that and he's going to say what he wants. And no doubt, I mean, you, you watch your dad. We all do. Uh, we watch Christian leaders. We see what's happening in politics, and we see people coming after each other, even in the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, seriously, mm-hmm. it's 
I mean, how do you how do you, you mean separate the ugliness yourself? of social media? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. We're born with tough skin. It never <laughs> bothers me. You know, growing up, I never read one article, not one, about my grandfather or my dad. And probably till after I was out of college, because then social media just makes it more difficult to avoid and yeah. dismiss. And you go on Twitter. I always say, do not go on Twitter at the last thing at night, because you'll go to bed angry and mad. And oh, it'll mess you up. Yeah, you'll be thinking about it all. But I was born with thick skin. But most I people really... do, by the way. And it's dangerous because we don't unplug from any of it. And you're, you go to bed with those thoughts in your mind and those negative thoughts. That I've stopped doing it the last thing at night. But I was born with thick skin. I do what God has called me to do. Franklin Graham is called to do what Franklin Graham, what only God has called him to do. And what he's called Tim Clinton, it's different. We're to have different voices. Right. In, in the body of Christ, when we see, especially in the last couple of years, Christians attacking Christians for political views and this and that, I can honestly say I've never heard my dad criticize another pastor, another ministry, ever. He might have concerns that he shares with you know, his close group of friends, but never publicly and not even in front of us kids has he criticized another pastor. He said, if they're not doing something they're supposed to, God will deal with them. He doesn't need Franklin Graham to deal with them. And a lot of times, you and I run with a bunch of different evangelicals, and maybe we've been we criticized some for some. We do. And my dad also said to me one time, he said, Sissy, we have more in common than we don't. So as Christians, because sometimes one time I said, Dad, what about this person? He goes, Sissy, we have more in common than we don't, and that's Jesus. I like that. Sissy, how do you keep yourself plugged in personally, your relationship with the Lord? What is it that keeps you anchored in him? I know you get all that family influence. I remember when my dad died. It was about 30 days after it. I went up into the mountains, the Blue Ridge Mountains, and I, I sat down at the Peaks of Otter Lodge by mm. myself. You've, you've been there? I've never been to the lodge, but I used to drive through there. Hey, the- I sat down in that lodge, and I wrote a letter to my dad. You know, it was kind of a um, mm. thank you, dad letter. And I remember wrestling uh, with the Lord there while I was praying, and I was asking myself about the God of my father, okay? I remember driving down the peaks of Otter Lodge Hill toward Bedford, Virginia, and it was like God dropped this thought in my mind, Tim, do you worship the God of your father, Mm. or is he your God, Mm. okay? And in that moment, it was like God said something to me as I echoed back to him. I said, I worship the God of my Father, who is my God. And it was, a, it was a real defining moment for me, just to remind myself that that influence was really significant, and I thank God for it every day. And it was for a reason, so that his God would be my God. Wow. You know, and anchor myself. For you, sissy, and I think this is what we all have to do every day. Paul said in Romans 7, the things I wouldn't do, I do, and the things I would do, I don't. So daily, I've got to reckon and yield my life to Christ. Mm. What would you say to women out there who just want to be encouraged? They're with you. Life's tough, you know what I'm saying? Um, but it's just like they want to live bold. They want to live in the now. They want to, they want to know their life matters, and they want to know God loves them and cares for them. I think the greatest, you know, and especially as young moms, we can go through seasons of loneliness to feel like we're really lonely. And in those moments, God whispers to me if I'm complaining, like, oh, why didn't my husband do this? Or why doesn't somebody help me out with this? And I realize I'm really lonely, but God is there. And that's truly a whisper and go, sissy, I'm what you need. And I think we have this vision, too, of what our devotion should be like. I want to wake up. I want it to be ideal, sweet, and quiet, and my coffee, and sitting in a comfortable chair. And in that stage of my life, that's not what it looks like. Yes, a lot of mornings I'll get up before the crack of dawn and um, be able to have that quiet time with my, before my kids wake up. It's not always. Sometimes I'm in the carpool line with, I got five minutes of quietness before the kids, and I'm reading it. It's, it's not ideal. And this year, I've really been convicted, especially for millennials, and the dedication of our prayer life. What does our prayer life look like? And we can look at Lot and Abraham. Lot was called a righteous man in the New Testament, but there was no record of his prayer life and his conversations with God. Now, Abraham, of course, there was. 
But what does our prayer life look like? I look at other religions. We look at Islam and their dedicated prayer life five times a day and stuff. What are we as Christians? Sometimes we get, we're anxious and we're busy and we're here and we're there. And you might say a quick prayer in the car. Nothing wrong with that. But is it dedicated? Is it disciplined? And that for 2020 has been a challenge for me. My communication should, with God should be dedicated and disciplined throughout the day. I love that. You have a brand new podcast mm-hmm. called Fearless. Tell our audience about uh, the podcast, why you started it, um, what's the relevance? I mean, why should people be dialing in and listening to that? So this really started burning back in 2016 during the presidential election. Yeah. And I saw evangelicals saying they weren't going to vote. And I said, "How I've traveled the whole world, and what an honor it is in this country to vote. And we saw what was at stake in 2016. It, it was two polarizing differences our country could go in. And um, I had examples of godly parents, and I know not everybody does, but how can we take the emotion out of it all and have a conversation as Christians to navigate through this world? And 2016 was obviously polarizing for many people. Oh, yeah. But how do we have these conversations? Because they're not political issues. Abortion's not a political issue. This is a biblical moral issue. Um, and all these other issues the end about homosexuality and same-sex marriage, these are biblical moral issues as Christians who aren't able to have the conversation because they don't know what God's Word says. Yeah. So in Fearless, I want people to have a fearless faith, to be able to stand up strong in a country, be unashamed of the gospel, and have a fearless faith in a compromising culture. And how do we navigate through a culture that's forever shifting and changing, calling us names? Yeah. How can we embolden one another? Yeah. Um, we're fighting the clock. We're almost done here. And uh, what a delightful conversation. Sissy, let me let me hand it over to you. Um, a, a final challenging word. I think we share a common concern. We want the church to awaken and to step into this moment. We can't, we, we cannot allow ourselves to be silenced, to be shamed or whatever, uh, and muzzled. It's, it's time to step into the moment and have a voice on these kind of issues. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are afraid or they're timid. A lot of pastors are, are, are silent, but this is not a moment for that. No, it's not. We have been blessed beyond our imagination for the nation that we live in. And it could all come crumbling down if we are silent. And we've looked at history and past in Europe and stuff that the church was silent. We cannot be silent and we have to stand up. But to be able to stand in confidence, and this is just a conviction of my heart in last years, these Christians, you got to know God's word because that's your sword. That's yeah. the one you're going to be able to fight that's the enemy with. And you got to be able to stand on the solid rock of God's word. Yeah. And because this world, it is going to come against us as Christians. We know it. The Bible says it. You are to He's a rock of offense. It. You bet. We are to expect it. They came after Jesus. He said they'll come after us. And you know what? Bring it on. That's what I say. Is stand strong and let the enemy come. We are going to fight. We're not going to go down silent. Well, God be with us. And uh, what a delight to have this conversation with you. Can't wait to have you back. I know Dr. Dobson sends his regards. He has such an affection for you and your family, your dad, of course, and so much more. Well, thank you, Tim, for having me today. You've been listening to Dr. Tim Clinton's interview with Sissy Graham Lynch today here on Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and I encourage you to learn more about today's guest by going to drjamesdobson.org. There you'll see links to her work at Samaritan's Purse and also the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Find all of this when you go to drjamesdobson.org and then click on to today's broadcast page. Go now to our resources tab at drjamesdobson.org. You can look at any of Dr. Dobson's classic books, teaching DVDs, and popular broadcasts, which are there in our library. So take advantage of Dr. Dobson's years of parenting know-how today. Find all of this when you visit the resources tab at drjamesdobson.org. That's drjamesdobson.org. Thanks for tuning in today, and be sure to join us again next time when you'll hear Dr. Dobson's recent discussion with Rabbi Daniel Lappin. They'll examine the common moral underpinnings of Judaism and Christianity. It's a fascinating interview that you won't want to miss, and it's coming your way tomorrow on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk.
This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Hello, everyone. This is James Dobson inviting you to join us for our next edition of Family Talk. Every day we come to these microphones with someone in mind, whether it's a busy mom looking for tips on discipline or a husband who wants to learn more about connecting with his wife. We want to put an arm around your family in any way that we can. So join us next time for Family Talk, won't you? Hey everyone, Roger Marsh here. When you think about your family and where they will be when you're no longer living, are you worried? Are you confident? Are you hopeful? What kind of legacy are you leaving for your children and their children? Here at Family Talk, we're committed to helping you understand the legacy that you're leaving for your family. Join us today at drjamesdobson.org for helpful insights, tips, and advice from Dr. James Dobson himself. And remember, your legacy matters.